anthropologist from Cuba. Um, he got a diploma in tropical agriculture in for pasture and forage systems from the University of Queensland in Australia back in the 70s. And then he went back to Cuba and got his PhD at the Agrarian University of Havana in forage systems. He then spent 10 years working at the Institute for Animal Science in Cuba, and then 15 years as the director of the Institute for Pasture and Forage Systems. He helped uh, found the Organic Agriculture Group in 1992, which was a group that was fundamental in promoting the spread of agroecology across the island. And so for really more than 20 years, Fernando has maintained that his country's future agricultural production lies in organic and urban farming, and has been working on that since he began his career. Prior to 1991, as many of you know, Cuba depended a great extent on Soviet Union. And since its collapse, Fernando has worked hard to promote sustainable agriculture and to help Cubans make a living. In 1999, he received the Right Livelihood Award along with his group that was formed in 1992, the Group for Organic Agriculture, and went to Sweden to receive that award. And he's the lead editor of Sustainable Agriculture and Resistance, Transforming Food Production in Cuba, published in 2002 by Food First, and now a second edition will be coming out on that, of that book. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank Vermont Caribbean Institute, who is the organization that has sponsored this traveling to different farms and different people who are working on alternative food systems in Vermont. So Vermont Caribbean Institute, thank you for organizing that. And also to UVM Plant and Soil Science, to the Gunn Institute, and to Food Systems Initiative for supporting this particular seminar today. So I'm going to pass the microphone off to Marisha, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont Caribbean Institute. She's going to give you a brief background on the organization, and then we'll pass the microphone over to Fernando Funes. Thank you. Hi, very briefly, um, because I'm sorry for a little bit late. I also want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's really delightful to see, to, to see such a turnout here. Um, thank you again to the sponsors, and thank you above all to Fernando Funes for being here. Um, his visit here is really a major star in a constellation of activities that Vermont Caribbean Institute does in Cuba and has been doing for over 10 years. We work in the areas of community development, the environment, education, and the arts. Um, we've been working with Dr. Funes for several years. I want to give a lot of credit to um, his visit here today to a group of travelers from Vermont who were in Cuba in 2012 when we put together the first steps of a link, linkage between Vermont and Dr. Funes's work in sustainable agriculture. Uh, it's taken us a while since 2012 to bring him here, but that's how things happen sometimes in Cuba. Um, we, as an organization, remain very committed to following up with Dr. Funes and his colleagues after this visit. We're putting together a strategic plan that will engage Cuba uh, and Vermont agriculturalists, agronomists, um, environmentalists um, in future work in sustainable ag in Cuba. Um, I'd like to specifically invite all of you to participate in that, uh, the planning and the follow-up to Dr. Funes's visit. We take our title of Vermont um, Institute of the Caribbean very seriously and hope that our work represents Vermont and what Vermont has accomplished in these areas. And again, uh, open up our work to all the UVM community and all the academic communities here. Um, I want to thank some other travelers who have been to uh, Cuba with us, including John Erickson and Salim Ali, um, Arzul Morliart from UVM and the Gun Institute. Um, all of your work has contributed significantly to where we are now and where we continue. Finally, um, UV, uh, BCI has just developed a partnership with St. Michael's College. So we are, in addition to our people-to-people -people work, which we've been doing in Cuba for 10 years, we are now in a, a very good position to leverage more resources for um, academic exchange and collaborative academic research. So again, that's what we'll be following up with, with Dr. Funes after this visit. Um, and finally, I, I think I would be remiss if I didn't just mention that we have a um, uh, staff person in Cuba, Thelma Esnard, which many of you know. She's been working with us for a number of years. She's a dynamite little lady who, when Vermonters travel to Cuba, she takes them around in her perhaps a 40-year-old Russian Lada car. Um, and I would be willing to say in terms of Vermont's impact, this is a good example. Uh, 
I think that Delma has the only car in all of Havana, perhaps all of Cuba, that has a bumper sticker on it that says, Eat More Kale. <laughs> so again, um, please join us in our efforts to connect uh, Vermont and Cuba in a variety of areas, particularly in sustainable ag. Um, it's a tremendous honor to me personally, and on behalf of all of our work in Cuba, to introduce again Dr. Fernandez Gunis. Well, and this one. You should use this one. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm confused because my guy this. Uh, put me so busy that I don't remember the times and so on and so on. I'm quite old and then, well, uh, thank you very much to all the authorities of the VCI, Marisha, his, her staff, her staff, to the University of Vermont, especially to Margarita. A, she's fantastic, she has been driving the car uh, cooking very well sometimes, uh, <laughs> my guide in everything, and she programmed to me everything. It's a, I'm a sort of robot like this, but a very happy robot, because I have been enjoying this trip completely. My trip uh, began in San Francisco. We are a group of Latin American agroecologists that we met during a week there, visiting farms and so on. I came later on to Michigan. Then Vermont, three or four days, three or four days, and then now still going <laughs> to Delaware mañana, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> and then uh, North Carolina, Miami a couple of days, and then back to my dear Cuba. Well, this is a pleasure to, to see many people that have been visiting us in, in Cuba. And I have been uh, sharing ideas, knowledge, and interactions with Vermontians? Vermonters? Vermonters? I don't like Vermonters. Looks like monsters, and you are completely the opposite. <laughs> and that's right. My dear uh, Vermonters uh, friends, the last few days, and today will be, I am very happy because uh, we have to, to leave that place. I said, uh, Margarita, this is very small because in every time here uh, will be been plenty of people and I'm very, very happy to, to see that. Well, uh, you are, uh, all of you are very diversified. I like that diversification. And then you are very di diversified for that reason. Uh, I try to, to do, with the help of Margarita ideas, to present a very wide ideas, uh, because you, there are researchers, professors, uh, producers, uh, farmers, etc. Then I will present you more or less the state of agroecology in Cuba, how it has been the background and then the present situation. Okay. I will introduce you Cuba, very small country. Uh, we are only 11.2 millions of inhabitants. The uh, length of the country very small, I mean 1,200 kilometers, with uh, 220 and the less uh, 45 kilometers, more or less. It's a long and narrow island. Uh, we are now close to 25% of people in the countryside. It decreased a lot in early 90s. We were only 14, but at the beginning of 1959, at the beginning of the Cuban Revolution, there were, uh, and we were, because I was alive already, 56% of the people, the people have been going from the countryside to the cities in order to study, to become physicians, agronomists, uh, lawyers, and da, da, da. And then the countryside uh, had a very strong immigration. We have quite good soils in the country. Next one, please. This is the climate, more or less, in order to the rainfall, we have about 1,400 millimeters a lot of water in order to other places, but then we have a bad distribution, 80% in the wet season and 
about 20%, 25% in the dry season. The main temperature is 26. Today we have here 10, 26. And the mean is about 25. Uh, we have 26 in the, you know, 27 in the wet and, and warm season and uh, 23 in, the, in our winter. Very severe winter. It's a <laughs> you should realize. Okay. More or less some indicator of the Cuban population to locate you more or less in how we are uh, now. Cuba was a poor country with many pro problems, poverty, of health uh, problems, a lot of infant mortality, so on. And it has been advances in the last uh, 50 years since the triumph of the revolution. We are now more or less the double of the population that was 6 million people at that time. But um, we have more or less the same quantity of men and women. Sometimes somebody said to me that the, in the world there were two, women's, two women for every male. I said, what is the other that uh, is mine? You see, that belongs to me because I, I, I always have had only one. <laughs> okay, but in Cuba we are 50 uh, percent. We are uh, like this. Then, 60 years and more, about 18 percent, 17.8, the last uh, uh, figures. In urban areas, 75, only 25 now from before we were, as I said, uh, 56. Literacy rate is more than 95%. In 1961, we had from 6 million, a million of illiterate people in, in the country. It was a very high figure. And then in 1961, two years after the, the revolution, the youngers, from, even from primary school sums, but mainly secondary school, high schools, went to the mountains and the countryside to teach the people, to, to literate, I mean to teach the people to, to read and to write. My wife, unfortunately, she died uh, seven years ago, Marta Monsote, Dr. Marta Monsote. She was a bright agroecologist. I, I said her to be the queen of agroecology in Cuba. Marta, when the literacy campaign was only 13 years old, and living always with uh, their parents in the, in the um, capital city and so on. And when this uh, call, she said, I want to go. The parents didn't want. Finally, her combined uh, her mother. Martha combines uh, her mother. And then the father was not too happy. He said, well, provided I can go sometime there to the place and about two or three hours. He could uh, see her like this. She was always very proud to, to this campaign because they teach people it's a lot of poverty and that they were not able to, to sign. And then they did a very nice campaign. And now we, are, uh, we have maintained that standard and helping many other countries to do like this. University graduates, more than 500,000. Uh, Inhabitants per medical doctor, 183. It's very, very, very high figure. When the deal for the revolution, there were only 6,000 physicians in Cuba for the whole country. Very, very low rate. But then 50% of those came out of the country. They gone out, they were, uh, had good positions and so on, and they, most of them came to the state and so on, and there were only 3,000 physicians. But then it has been a very fast growing uh, in, in the in teaching of medicine. We have the thousand of students from abroad, from poor countries of uh, mainly Latin America, but also Africa, and some Americans, the Afro North Americans, are studying in Cuba in our uh, International School of Medicine. The infant mortality: 4.2 4 per thousand children birth alive. This is a very high figure, also only compared to Sweden and to New Zealand. Higher than yours. You can check the standards and the, and the uh, st statistics. And living, living expectancy, 78 years old. This is a good figure, but uh, I don't like so much because <laughs> I am reaching that age in some years. And what happened to me? I can then dance in Roomba or something like this. 
And, well, let's go to the technical side. Cuban agricultural history. You know, we were discovered uh, October uh, 1942. I was not alive yet. I mean, uh, 1492. <laughs> I wasn't alive yet. And then uh, came the Spaniards, colonized uh, Cuba. Cuba was one of the first lands discovered after the 12th of October. And then 27th was discovered uh, Cuba. Then, well, not discovered. We said that discoverers of Cuba were the aboriginal people that came before from South America. They were living there. They were destroyed completely. Then uh, all that Spaniard ages, um, the agriculture was composed, the, the agriculture of the indigenous people was very poor, completely poor, or almost nothing. And then the Spaniards came, took over the country, and began to, to have very big haciendas. You know, the big haciendas, cattle or like sugar cane, like this. And then uh, later on, it, it was going and going, and Cuba was converted in a country based on mono, monocropping, monoculture, mainly based in sugar cane, as you can see there. Monocropping, completely monocropping. Then export or, or, or orientation with a very few products at the beginning, mainly sugar cane and some others. Natural records, the resources overexploited. Then came the triumph of the revolution after 1959. But then, uh, suddenly, after 62, uh, Cuba had the embargo of the state of, the, of your country. I think that I, I hope that some of you, maybe one of the younger, will be president of the states any time and broke the, the blockade with my grandchildren, I don't know. Then, uh, well, the idea is that since that, Cuba became isolated. Cuba be, uh, lost more than 85% of the trade with the blockade, via the embargo, you call it embargo. Uh, lost more than 85% of the trade, and it was terrible for Cuba. We had a very bad situation. We were at 90 miles there in a ferry, uh, two ferries every day from uh, Havana to, to Florida, to Key West, and we lost suddenly that. We, well, we began to stand up, and then we were completely without relation with, because the, the uh, United States uh, did the lobby with the other countries, and every country broke relation with Cuba, except two exceptions, Canada and Mexico. The only way to go out of, the, of Cuba like this, like this, were Canada and Mexico. Some relation, uh, commercial relation with Canada, and uh, not with Mexico, but it was the place that I, when I went to study to Australia, I had to go Mexico City, Vancouver, and then uh, Australia and New Zealand and so on. Uh, then the countries that uh, we had the relation were Japan or Singapore, very thousands and thousands of kilometers away. Then the socialist countries said, well, we can maintain relation that, and we began the relation with the socialist bloc, Bulgaria, Hungary, da, 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 and mainly with the Soviet Union. We had a very fair trade at Guay, at Guay, but it was fair trade, but was more or less a type of subsidy to our crops, to our uh, economy, because uh, we received a very few prices the the items or the each um, inputs and then uh, we continuous the trend that came since the fi uh, the, the final uh, at the end of the second world war to use in agriculture the known as a green revolution technologies based on very high inputs machinery uh, heavy irrigation and so on and we embraced that one, but then when the Soviet people and the uh, socialist countries came, they were in the same trend, because everybody was thinking that it was going to solve the situation of poverty, hunger, and, and so on in, in this uh, whole world. And we follow that way. And Cuba, a very poor and little country and so on, we embraced the, the idea. ¿Me están entendiendo o no? ¿Te creen que me están entendiendo? My English. Is good my English or uh, is it not good enough or not? Si no me entiende, no sé lo que. Well, 
And then we base our systems in very high external input. Agricultural subsidies. Conventional agriculture completely. And then it has consequences as consequences. Soil degradation, extensive soil degradation, losses of biodiversity, extensive deforestation, low food self-sufficiency, low energy efficiency in all our systems, and high external dependence. Uh, that way, Cuba was like this, 60s, 80s, uh, 60s, 70s, and uh, uh, 80s. In late 1989 and the beginning of 90s became again a sudden crisis. Suddenly, unexpected, like this, like this, because it was the collapse of the socialist bloc. It was the disintegration of the Soviet Union. Again, Cuba, with more than 85% of the trade, and we were almost destroyed, you see? Many people began to cry, and many people began to come to the States and to anywhere, escaping from Cuba because they couldn't resist that. There were many people also dreaming. The leader, some of the leaders of the Minister of Agriculture and so on, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, they were dreaming to see the big vessels coming to Cuba, plenty of inputs and like this. And we were uh, third, uh, the other group was uh, people from Miami, the Cubans from Miami, and other uh, dreamers, uh, Cuban dreamers. They wanted to, they said, no, we are going back to Cuba. And they were uh, dancing, vamos no pa Cuba, vamos no pa Cuba, like this, go to Cuba, go to Cuba, uh, dancing rumba. But there were another uh, group of people, the crazy people, like me, that we said, no, 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 we're not going to, to cry and to go down. We're going to resist. We are going to do something to stand up and to start a new way of producing. We were reading already something about uh, organic farming, uh, not agroecology at all, but ecological uh, affairs, uh, Rachel uh, Silent Spring uh, book, Rachel Carson, uh, like this. And then we began to work very hard. We had a very nice and very, uh, a lot of solidarity from many people from abroad. And mainly, it's uh, funny, but mainly from this, uh, this country from the United States. People from Food Fair, Dr. Peter Rosset, and then Miguel Altieri from Berkeley, that is Chilean, Chilean one, and many other, Lorian Troop, and then uh, Monica Moore, and many people went to Cuba to help us, to, to check hand with us. And we began to do almost all their suggestions. Well, we analyzed which were the, the possible to apply there. And we began to do those things many, very fast. <laughs> we didn't have much time. Because, for example, I lost uh, 25 pounds. It was like this. You see how handsome I am now. <laughs> it was like this. Then we began to work. I was lucky to be one of the first people involved in that. Because before that time, before the crisis, me and my wife and some other people, we were thinking that it was impossible to, to support, to withstand that sort of agriculture in Cuba because everything was coming from abroad and like this, and then uh, we began to do things. Pastures and forage, we began to, to use uh, a grass legume source and to use legumes for cattle and like this and like this. Then everybody in different institutions isolated, began to do things, and then we were prepared for, for that change. And we began to apply those things. Then it led this collapse and, and this situation that day was funny because we call it special period. I am also asking me why special. It was no, nothing special. Special is a very good thing, isn't it? And it was nothing was good there. Led to unprecedented change in intensity in agriculture with low external inputs, much more use of, of our available and local resources, and intensive knowledge systems. You can see there irrigation. Excuse me, this is in, in Spanish. You can see Cuba, blue one, Latin American and Caribbean countries. Uh, you speak Spanish because you understand very well that, isn't it? And United States, the, the purple one. Then you can see in the level of application of fertilizer per 
in kilos per hectare, we were double than the states, and we, three times uh, in comparison to Latin American and Caribbean countries. Tractors per hectare and machinery in general, we double Latin American and uh, the state were a bit more than us, but you see a little country, a poor country compared to the state, it's astonishing. Then, in the case of irrigation, you can see we had the first place. We had a very unsustainable system. Mm, we were applying a very unsustainable, simple, simple uh, in our country. This is an, an example. Our cattle, our swine, our poultry came completely from Canada. We imported be very valuable and very worthy bulls, a lot of semen of the best bulls of Canada, and all the poultry and uh, swine breeds to Cuba, imported, in order to transform the nature, because the cattle in Cuba is based in double-purpose cattle, uh, came to India, where is uh, La India, donde está, que, que andaba por ahí, my friend. And then uh, we began to, to do a back crossing system. And we, we had very high, uh, high result and very good results. Good, like this. We have, for example, this cow, white other, Ubre Blanca. Ubre Blanca was the world record, this cow, with 110.9 liters in a day. Many days of 107, 109, and, uh, and the whole lactation, 27,600 uh, and, and so on in the whole lactation. World record is in butter fat, in uh, percentage of fat in the milk. It was fantastic. And it goes across three quarters Holstein and one quarter Cebu cattle. It was fantastic. But that, that cow was unsustainable completely. She ate about 7% of her body weight. <laughs> she was sick. Normally, a cattle can eat 2.8, 2.9 uh, foods of uh, dry matter of uh, her body weight, and it was a little bit. We have heard of 30, 40 liters as a mean. When the change of the special period came, all of those animals died because we didn't have concentrates. We have a, a bunch, a handful of concentrate, and we had to give to the, to the poultry because the, the hens save us with the eggs. And we have to devote the, the few grains that we had, and we could afford, uh, to the hens. Cows died massively, 100,000 of very, that's very rich in in standard foreign blood uh, animals died. And then uh, were um, subsisting the more uh, in the crosses and something like this. Then, uh, well, it was an example, but we have many, very many examples, high uh, uh, yields in the crops, but uh, completely unsustainable based on heavy application of fertilizer, Agrotoxics, I mean chemicals for everything. Uh, irrigation schemes very uh, con a lot of, uh, with a lot of water expenditure and so on. Well, we have been challenging since, since that, that time the decreasing of forestry cover. When Columbus came, uh, the island was covered in 95 percent for for of forest, and now. You will reach, uh, you will see the figures later. A pollution, waste, loss of biological biodiversity, soil degradation, water scarcity, climate change that have been coming. We have been aware the last few years much more. For example, uh, we are very vulnerable as an archipelago and uh, as an island. And the temperature is going slowly, slowly, but increasing, I mean, dramatically. The level of the sea, mean sea level, uh, is increasing, and we have been already since now retiring our houses in the sea coast to inland in order to avoid the, the problems in the future. We have been having change in rainfall patterns, and we have severe meteorological events, such as 
hurricanes, cyclones, that, cyclones which are very common in, in the Caribbean islands. About biodiversity, Cuban flora is very rich and was always very rich in biodiversity, one of the most rich all around the world. And then we have been trying to maintain that biodiversity because this Green Revolution procedures avoid and destroy forests and destroy all the everything. And then we have been trying to maintain, we have an, uh, almost every province center for conservation, and we maintain a lot of thousands of samples and, and different institutions are looking after that. We are very rich in fruits and everything. The Cuban biodiversity is uh, fantastic, and we, are being pro we have been protecting the last few years uh, this sort of biodiversity. In the soil degradation, we have been applying many measures in order to avoid the, the, soil, the degradation with agroecological strategies, diversification, and better use of, of available resources. Uh, we, in the last, uh, since uh, the early of this century, we have been overcoming and uh, improving more than 500,000 uh, uh, hectares every year in the country. You can see, and then other alternatives for soil fertility and nutrition, improving of soil compost, mulch and green manures, bulk composting, and many other ways that we use even in, in the plantain, we use the one culture in the bottom and so on and so on. That of the last uh, one I know very well him since he was born, you see. Since he was alive. <laughs> Forest cover. When the triumph of the revolution, Columbus we had 95% or more than uh, forest areas at that time. And then it came down and down and down. And in 1959, with all the procedures of Green Revolution, it fell to 14%. And the revolution has been trying to improve and to improve. And in 2007, we already had 25.3 percentage of uh, forest uh, cover. And now we're about 27%. And the goals for the next uh, targets for the next few years uh, is uh, much higher. Our agriculture has been uh, working in this trend since the 90s to, to now. Monoculture against diversification, I mean to increasing the diversity and heterogeneity of agriculture in our country, mainly in the last 20 and some years that we have been in our uh, agroecological and organic uh, farming movement. Centralization against decentralization. Cuba was, as many other socialist countries, were very centralized, strongly centralized. From the top of the country were decisions and so on. And we have been working towards the decentralization to that uh, everybody in their uh, locality and the municipality and in their uh, environment take the decisions. And it has been like this and going very well. Uh, we have been we have been, uh, had uh, changes in the land tenancy structure. You will be seeing cooperativization and use of fruit lands. State-owned lands have declined from 80% in the 90s to 20% in, uh, and now it's about 25%. Considerable reduction in, uh, and now it's about 15, 17%. Considerable reduction in the size of the, of the farms. The state farms were huge areas of land. The food import has been changed to food self-sufficiency. Then the local food production, instead of production of forest pork, uh, has been going on strongly in Cuba. In 1983, it was an effort to reduce the size of the huge areas of the state uh, farms. And then we are created. Uh, already we knew that the small cooperative a private uh, composed by, by several private producers were much more efficient than the state land. And the state tried to do this, to, to create this UBPC, basic unit of cooperative production. It was due to the low efficiency of agricultural and state enterprises, and then uh, those and we are broken into basic unit of cooperative production or we have with the workers of the of those places uh, they bought the animals and so and so some sort of process like this 
But the, those uh, cooperatives has not been so so successful because the people were used to be workers, to be owners of the thing. And some of those did very well, but not all the places. Okay. You can see or the process of land tenure structure. At the beginning of the crisis, the state had 83% of the land. In 1993, was reduced to 57 with the creation of UBPC. And then, um, in 2008 already, uh, decreased to 23. To land tenure. And now, it decreased, as I said, I said you before, till 2018-17. The new cooperative, came already in 1993, 26, and they, they grow to 40% until 2008. And then the private and usufruct uh, units, which are cooperative of agricultural production and cooperative of credit and services, and individual farmers that were very few at the beginning of the crisis of the, uh, of the 90s, grew to 17 and now are 37% of the people. And uh, with new lands, uh, new laws of land tenure and so on, are growing very fast. At that time, in the early 90s, we decided to organize a group called ACA, the promoter group of uh, a Cuban Association of Organic Farmers. At that time, agroecology was not so well known, and we decided to put Organic Farming uh, Association. In fact, this group was never of officialized for the state. The state allowed us to, to work and so on, but they were a bit, um, um, what is it, temeroso? Afraid. 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 Were you there? <laughs> Well, uh, then they were a bit afraid of these uh, people uh, trying to change all the structure that they, they were having. We were a group of professional technicians and farmers, producers, interested in the redesign of Cuban agriculture based on uh, organic and agroecological principles. Principle. Uh, then the general trend was after 60 years of Green Revolution, since the 40s, 30 years of very intensive green revolution in Cuba, after the Cuban revolution, we began to, to change gradually, and we began to develop an organic agriculture and agroecology since the 90s. That intensive industrial paradigm, which caused productive and environmental problem, was transformed to a sustainable, low-input agriculture, not basic machinery, fertilizers, and so on and so uh, that is much more independent using ecological and organic production techniques. We have had uh, quite uh, successful programs. We could uh, quote as the, one of the first one, urban agriculture. We didn't have any urban agriculture in Cuba and we developed a very strong system of urban agriculture. Farmer to farmer or peasant to peasant learning program. Popularization of low input rice production. Rice was completely based in high input and still have a place, the high input in, in the rice production in Cuba. Medicinal plants, because we didn't have any aspirin to, to use, and then we, we had to go to the background of the peasants and, and the even indigenous people. Then the diversification and integration of cattle, agriculture, and trees. Permaculture came from Australian and we are, began to apply in the lowest scale in permaculture, and the program on agricultural local innovation that we call PL and integral forestry farms. All of those things we have been developing in the, in the last few years. You can see some scenarios of agriculture, many windmills, and uh, every type of uh, low cost energy we have been applying. For example, we have been uh, using polycropping instead of monocropping, it's different mm -hmm. species, I mean. Uh, lower, uh, middle size, uh, higher, and so on. We will talk about uh, urban agriculture. This is a very nice scenario. At the beginning, the people were afraid. Afraid. The historian of the city of Havana said, "No, no, that agriculture there is not possible." But we discussed 
And we began to do that. And she said, oh, in fact, <laughs> are very nice gardens. It has been flourished, flourishing Havana environment. And then you can see all of those places in all sizes in, in Havana. We call Argono, organoponicos. And the left one is not in Havana, it's in the central province of Santa Clara. You can see the statistics only in 2006, from almost zero that we began in 1992. Already we had some figure in 1994 and it began to grow and to grow. And every people began to, to be interested instead to be consumers, to be producers. We had the idea always, very reinforcing our minds, to be consumers, to go to the market like this. But then we didn't have another choice. And we began to, to, to learn to be producers at a higher or a smaller scale in the backyard or patio, as we call it, in the balcony, in a piece of land that the state gave to the people to, that wanted to do that. Some retired people, when uh, it began, began to work there, but some people that were a doctor in medicine or lawyer, they came to his home and began in the other hour, uh, after hours to have their gardens. And then it began to change, and the people was able to observe and to feel that they were able to produce food for them, for their families, their relatives, and then also, in many cases, in the uh, bigger spaces, to produce for the neighborhood, to sell. You see, that it has been a tremendous growth. Uh, it was, at that time, about 4 million tons of uh, Main, mainly horticultural crops. Now it's, uh, it has been impossible to maintain the measures every year because we were measuring even the balconies of the people, but it was tremendous. And then we have maintained uh, not the whole one, but the organoponicos, intensive uh, gardens, and some uh, protected gardens, and so on. But more or less, it has been maintained more than 4 million tons of uh, production. You can see uh, almost uh, 50,000 hectares and a yield of about 8 uh, kilos per square meter per, per year. For, for example, home garden, small home gardens in the backyard. Let's go. Intensive garden, bigger areas, but uh, on the soil. You, we saw those going on the soil, and we apply substrate of organic matter, like this and like this. Okay. And then we have the bigger ones, are the organopon organoponicos, organoponics, which are with uh, raising beds. And then also applying uh, all type of uh, composting, or composting, and I mean improving the the, the, the soil. The using you, you can see uh, polycropping, leros and licks, licks, yeah, man. That cebollín. And okay, vamos, dale. Olvida el cebollín y cambia me. You can see this protected because you see during the warm season it's very very hard to, to maintain the crops and then we have been reducing about 30 percent of the shed I mean, of the sunlight and we are able to have lettuces or uh, tomatoes or da 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 cabbage in you know what is da 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 <laughs> okay you are smart okay another big goal that we had Chris. Centers of reproduction of entomophagos and anthropopathogens. We didn't have the, uh, another option and we were against the chemicals. And then, for that reason, it was not allowed to, to have uh, urban agriculture. But then we changed at that time and we began to create in the, in the country. And the state was helping all of that. Sometimes suspicious or something like this, but they were doing, they were doing, and they were going. The creation and dissemination of more than two. 150 artisanal centers for the reproduction of entomophags and entomopathogens. It allowed the equalization of Cuban agriculture, I mean, against the well known chemicals uh, uh, in agriculture, as a base for the biological control of pests and diseases. In order to the nutrition of the soils, and in order to the soils improvement and so on, we, we began to do everything, compost, warm culture. We managed very well the warm composting with the Red California warm. Many different types of biogas, fixed cupules and all like this, like this. But then, 
Uh, another uh, organic manures, some um, residues of the agricultural industry with transformancy, and uh, uh, green manures, and many other things. And <laughs> we have plenty of time. Okay, and then we began to use draft animals, animal draft in, in, in our, uh, instead of the machinery. Okay. This program of local innovation fair we have been doing in uh, small farmers everywhere, and it has been the base for the PIAL uh, project, as is the local innovation and so on, uh, in the whole country. It has been very successful. Contain a Goldman Medal of some years, the leader of this group. The integral forestry farm we had before only timber. Timber trees and forest and nothing below. Then the state decided to, in, in order to the proposition of the of, uh, people, to begin to have animals below in the bottom, to have, for example, beehives, to have uh, uh, squash and uh, many other horticultural crops below, okay, looking after the, the trees and all the production for uh, below the, the forest is for the owner, or I mean for the worker of the farm and his family, and then um, the, the wood and the, the timber trees are for the estate and a percentage for, for him. It has been very successful. Also. Now we have thousands of people involved in that. We, in the cattle production and in the sheep production, goats and, and, and so on, we have been using silvopastoral systems, using trees, and it generates benefits for the animal production. For example, this plant Linkina is a, a shrub that has more than 25% of protein. Fantastic. Much better than a concentrate. We have been using many other plants. Mulberry. Mulberry is used uh, for silk worm. In my institute, we are also working for, for making silk. silk but then it has been a very good uh, fit for, for cattle. The other one, Moringa, Moringa oleifera. Uh, even Fidel Castro, which is very, very old, 80, uh, 88 years. Fidel is growing Moringa and Morera and those things in, mm, around his home and he showed to every visitor and so on. And, and he's encouraging this, this type of Grow. Moringa is fantastic also not only, not only for cattle and animals but, but for the people. It's a very good salad and so on. Well, some other things. Animal husbandry of different kinds, poultry, rabbits, so on. We have developed the agroecological movement from farmer to farmer, uh, led by the National Association of Small Farmers, with a group of basic principles, uh, preferring to go slowly than very quickly and uh, to consolidate the different subsystems uh, to develop a multiplicative effect. They have the promoter, which is uh, one of the best uh, uh, farmers of the group and people that have skills to, to teach the others. And uh, we organize there, or they organize there, because it's a, a, an app uh, movement. Uh, workshops and uh, education uh, days and so on. The promoter, the, there is a, a also facilitator, a that technician and police makers that participate, and we have that all around the country. It began in 1997, and you can see from that, that we, we were in zero, you can see the figures till uh, 2009, and now we have more than uh, 150,000, or uh, about 180,000 people, in, uh, families involved in this movement. Okay, different ways of uh, using it in the, these small farms. We're going to show you some, this farm is very interesting. Well, they are producing here organic potato there and many other crops, the cabbage and so on. And then uh, they are applying uh, efficient microorganisms. They collect a pool of microorganisms below in the, uh, in, the, in the decay leaves under the forest. And then they do a solid stage, another liquid stage, and so on. And uh, it's tremendous the importance in order to improve the yields 
and also the health of the crop. Fantastic. That one you see, this is the liquid state to that, that he applied with this pump. For that reason his uh, energy efficiency is not so high because uh, he applied with the machinery and so on that that's a sweet potato. You have the figures here of the farm, farm of 40 hectares, and the energy efficiency is 11.2 of output for every energy unit input that he applied. It's very, very good, but in comparison, it's a bit lower than others. But the use equivalent use land equivalent ratio of the land, excuse me, that is in Spanish, is 1.67. I mean, he produces in a hectare of land the equivalent uh, one sixty-seven times that is produced in a, a conventional hectare of land. Okay. This is the energy program. Energy program is a program developed by my, by my family. It was under the tutorship of my wife, Martha, and my son Fernandito, that is now a pre-operate agroecologist. Uh, Vice President of the Latin American Association of Agroecology, uh, engineer, uh, agronomist, uh, uh, master in Spain and Andalusia, and a doctorship in, in Wageningen in Holanda, and now he's a farmer. Uh, but he uh, did in 2006 this program, computer program, in order to measure the energy efficiency of the system. You put all the inputs and you have the output, and this uh, system gives you the efficiency, how you use all the things. You can put hand labor, uh, fuel, uh, everything that you use and you have the output. Well, this is the Fernandito's farm. It's called Finca Marta, the name of my, always remember her wife. It's an agroecology family farming. Fabio is my younger the grandchildren. He's producing a lot of uh, honeybee. He has cows. He has uh, goats. He has, uh, uh, I mean, sheep. A lot of horticulture. He's uh, commercializing. He's processing production, processing, commercializing, and consumption uh, farm. You can see they are doing the work of uh, horticulture, horticulture, and so on. Uh, honeybee are an important component of animal integration at the system level. He began with uh, one beehive a uh, year and a half, and now he, have, he has more than 45. This is his family and some of the workers and himself. Okay. It is very important the methodology uh, for building capacity. Lemdi by doing what publication, booklet, book, uh, primary schools, university, other postgraduate, and the farmer to farmer, and many other informal ways. It's a, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a market, a small market in, in the neighborhood, and the one is offered and the man and the question market, a higher one, a bigger one in the market. Well, we are having now a very important uh, law that developed the government uh, in 2008, the law 259. The state, after many years of proposition from many of us, began to give to the people, to every people that apply lands in use of fruit. It has been continuously growing since uh, uh, 2008, and then at uh, 3,000, uh, it was improved the law with some new, for example, it was not allowed to build a house and in the farm, and since uh, three, uh, 2012, it was like this, and today, more than one point million hectares has been given to the people that apply. I mean, has been some have been discarded for some reason, but most of the lands are given to the people that use of fruit. I mean, land belong to the state, but all the production and the house and the animals and all the production belongs to the, to the farmer. If it is a cooperative, they have to, uh, to pay some tax, but the others don't pay any tax. The UPPC, okay, local development, it's covering the whole country, taking the decision from grassroots to the top. There are more than 100,000 university graduates and technicians in agriculture in the country. This is a fortress. The improvement of regional and world relations for Cuba, 
economic and technical and everything is much better. We are now have relations with every country. You remember Mexico and Canada were the exception, but now every country, except one. I'm not going to tell you which is that one. This is a secret between Obama and Raul and Fidel and that one. Well, and then Raul, by the way, has declared, well, the decentralization of input has been taking place. And Raul Castro, the president, has declared that food production is the first state priority. No more bullets, no more wars, no more canyons, but feet are the more important task for humans. Well, the present contact are just those 180,000 new farmers, more than 1. million hectares of land distributed in the last six years. Uh, in food culture, we have increased a lot the vegetable consumption in, in, in the whole population, but since the schools, because we didn't have tradition to eat vegetables, and has been educated the people that is very healthy in order to, to the consumption of uh, vitamins and so on. So. Public Health Ministry recognizes the important role of fruit and vegetables in the diet of the people. And there are many ways to educate people on the consumption of fruit and vegetables. Despite all the advances of sustainable agriculture you have seen in, the, in my talk, in 2007, still we have about 50% of the food imported for a value of some 2 billion US dollars every year. More than 50% of the state land suitable for agriculture was abandoned, or very bad managed. The service sector in the country was prior, prioritized. Prioritized? Priorizado. In the country. Priorizado. You, do you follow me? And then you are learning Spanish, eh? <laughs> okay. Meanwhile, that situation in the state farm. The small farmers grew in cooperative of agricultural production and in cooperative of credit and services, which I will explain to you later on, and many small diversified private farms which didn't belong to the cooperative, they were farmers, simple farmers. Uh, with only 25 to 30 percent of the land produced 65 to 70 percent of agricultural food. That has been possible by rescuing rural peace and experience and knowledge, background, through farmer to farmer horizontal exchange, I have explained to you before, the promoter farmers with the fruitful exchange with researchers and professors involved in the, in the system. Well, we have been and we are involved here in these two opposite trends, or paradigms. One side, organic agriculture agri and agroecology, and on the other side, we still have some spots of green revolution, GMO technologies. We have a powerful institute of genetic engineering and biotechnology. And so years ago, they were trying to produce corn, uh, I mean, uh, uh, transgenic uh, corn. We had discussions, and we were very active in that. We had about five or six discussions. And finally, the result is that they have resigned. They have gone out because the results were very bad. And we, we had the, 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 reason, the reason, we had the, the truth. And it's been demonstrated. OK, Margarita, you are very, very slow today. <laughs> the threats and challenges for the Cuban agroecological movement were predominantly set towards industrial intensification, the release of transgenic crops, are threats and challenges. Cyclical return to support conventional agriculture when financial resource availability does allow, which strongly undermines the advances achieved in the application of an agroecological approach. Considerable difficulties in agricultural product processing and commercialization at small and middle scales, technologically, financially, and organizationally. The main challenge to follow the struggle for understanding and advances in the application of agroecology, to increase and establish a strong support and credit for the new farmers, returnable, returnable funds. I mean, we agree to, to have much more credit, this is necessary, but don't, we don't want that they, uh, the state give to the farmers, I mean, for free. After some time, they, they have to, to, to 
put back. To develop a very solid network of micro industries is very important. To follow given main emphasis to environmental issues in climate change. And uh, we have some weaknesses to solve yet, to advance much more in the rural agricultural sector. We have advanced a lot in the cities, but the main areas are in the countryside. And we have to be, it's a very big challenge to bring the people to the countryside. The people came to the cities now. I forget me, I've got married, they are uh, children, uh, they are doctors and that, and it's difficult, but there are ways. To develop properly a strong micro-industry, to consolidate organic standards and commercialization, we don't have a certified organic product. We have organic product, but we don't have the, the mechanism and the organization for uh, the organic uh, standard uh, system in the country, to encourage more participation of women and youth. The percentage is high, but we are still going on. For example, the micro-industries are very good for women job in this type of agriculture as an attractive source of moral and, and economic values. The co economy is very important. Then to stress social advantages, nation and environmental defense of our systems. I would like to, to do finally some reflection of my visit to Vermont. Uh, for example, uh, we have been visiting here the people of NOFA and the certification. Uh, we have a project now and we would like to go ahead because it's a source of uh, income for the farmers, maybe abroad or also into the country, selling to the hotels, to the tourism, to the foreign, foreign people living there. Because really for the Cubans, we don't want to, to raise too much the, the prices. We are trying, and my son, by the way, is trying to intensify the CSA system you have. Food hubs, we are very poor in that situation. We have seen tremendous things here in the, in the city and in Vermont. Congratulations. Food cooperatives, people to people knowledge exchange. I invite you to go to Cuba. I've been here, very happy. And we have to strengthen these uh, relations because anytime we will, every time we meet Americans, we are very good friends. After some time, sometimes I analyze if, <laughs> because you see, sometimes I say to people, I don't want to have any more friends because I have thousands of friends. Why more friends? <laughs> Normally my friend, Margarita is my friend. She doesn't solve me many things. And then I prefer to have enemies instead of that type of friends. But after I meet the people and see the people, and well, you will be my last friend and my last friend, and I have millions now of friends. <laughs> well, but it's important to strengthen relations and to understand each other much better. This problem of embargo, the situation, well, we are very strongly interested in having relations with the states. But well, not under on the, on the rules completely, we have to put our rules. The state have to put their rules and okay, because are we are friends of everybody, French people, uh, uh, Germanies, uh, Italians, uh, why not to, to our uh, neighbor here, okay? And also another thing, another reflection, <laughs> chica. Another reflection from this visit is the friendship I have found. Sincerely, not only here. I came some years ago about 30 years ago to the state, but I began now in California, California, Michigan, and then Vermont. The friendship has been this level. More, I can't, I can't reach that, but many friendship, many comprehension, very, very nice people, mainly the, the women. <laughs> but also some of the, okay, then uh, this is, we have to strengthen that. We have to take, advantage of a visit like this, of your visit, you see the friend of Maricha that talked before, Margarita, and uh, the people of this university, I mean BCI, Ben Caribbean Institute of the, the university, and some of the people in the state, but here in Vermont, they have been doing travels to, to Cuba. Sometimes you have to go to Cuba, you are not allowed for your government to go as a tourist, normal tourist, and you have Sometimes the people go through Canada like this, but then when they come back with a cigar in the hands, they are fine or they are received uh, uh, like this. 
And then we would like to be completely free to come and to go and to come. Like this. I think this visit from me to here. It's a little grain of sand in order to encourage this future of friendship and solidarity that you could also give us and we give you our modest contribution and our experience. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much.